First of all, welcome to Wellfest Monterey 2018. My name is Steve Elsey. I'm with Your Sanctuary TV, and, and we produce ocean films, ocean conservation films. Our next guest is really a, just a, a tremendous scientist and a, an extraordinary man, um, Benjamin Rosenthal. Uh, he is with Stanford University and, of course, uh, Hopkins Marine Laboratory. Those are affiliated. And Dr. Rosenthal is, uh, will be speaking from his personal research point of view on how a unique marine organism can give us answers to medical questions. Fascinating stuff. Enjoy. Dr. Rosenthal. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, first, I need to be honest with you. I'm not a marine biologist. I'm an immunologist, and I will try to explain to you how come immunologists are studying marine organisms to try to answer basic uh, immunological questions. Um, so yes, I'm, uh, I'm working between the Stem Cell Institute at Stanford University and also the Hopkins Marine Station. I'm working at the Irv Weissman uh, Laboratory. Can you place the microphone on, sorry, sir? Oh, yes. <laughs> so I'm working at the Irving Weissman's uh, Laboratory at the uh, Stem Cell Institute at the uh, School of Medicine at Stanford, and also Ayelet Voskobojnik, who's uh, running the Marine uh, Biology Laboratory at the uh, Hopkins Marine Station. So what am I going to talk to you about today? First of all, I'm going to give you an introduction to the immune system and making sure that all of you are going to be experts in, immune, in the immune system so you can understand everything we're talking about. And then I will be talking about my research during my PhD where I worked on natural killer cells in cancer and pregnancy immunology and how this research led me to this unique model for transplantation, the Botrylis schleseri. And this is a tunicate or a C-squirt as uh, you may know it. So what I'm trying to understand is how the immune system is recognizing its targets. And the immune system have two main arms. One is the innate immunity, and the other one is the adaptive immunity. And the idea is that the innate immunity is using pattern recognition receptors, and this is the receptors on the cells that can recognize different types of pathogens. And the idea is that you have small amount of receptors that can recognize a lot of different uh, types of pathogens. On the other hand, the adaptive immunity is using a recombinant receptors, a huge variety of receptors that it's creating, and they can recognize each one a specific pathogen, and they create the immunological memory. I will explain about later. The base of the whole immune and the blood system is the process called hematopoiesis. And in this process, we have the hematopoietic stem cells at the baseline, and they're creating all the different other cell types, like lymphocytes, myeloid, red blood cells, and the different types of the blood and the immune system. And if we look at the different types, we also can see the innate and the adaptive immunity receptors and the cell types that we have in our own blood. Oh. I need an angle. <laughs> is this better? Oh. So I don't know if you know, but what we have is B cells and T cells, and they're part of the adaptive immunity. The B cells are creating the antibodies, and T cells recognizing pathogens on our own cells. The innate immunity based, we have uh, phagocytic cells, like macrophages, that engulf the targets, or we have natural killer cells that they kill different cells in the body that are in abnormal state. So I will explain the idea behind the immunological memory and how the adaptive immunity works. So the idea is that we create a huge variety of receptors that each one can recognize different pathogens. And when a pathogen comes in, the receptor, the cell that expresses this receptor, is recognize it and then it multiplies. It's killing the infection and then we have immunological memory by creating a lot of those different cell types. And that's the idea behind vaccination. So for instance, with viruses, modern medicine has not much to do with and we actually don't have a lot of drugs against viruses. So the only way that we can deal with it is by creating vaccination. And after vaccination, we create a memory through the cells that can fight this infection when it happens. 
So I assume many of you know about the antibodies that create by the B cells, but also T cells have these unique receptors that can recognize targets on our own cells. And this is the base for cellular immunology, and I will explain. We see here a T cell recognizing a target or a natural killer cell recognizing a target. One is adaptive immunity that is recognizing the, the different molecules within the cells that are not self, and that way it can understand when we need to, to kill a target cell. Or we have a natural killer cell that is actually recognizing the self molecule, and this is like an ID that all the cells have to present it. And within this ID, this MHC molecule, the major histocompatibility complex, they have to present all the different molecules that we have in the cells. And if one of the molecules is, let's say, a viral molecule, or one of the molecules is a cancer-associated molecule, then the cell will be killed. If the cells will try to take the ID down, then the natural killer cells that are inhibited by this self ID will kill those cells. And that way we have a balance between innate and adaptive immunity that are finding, fighting set, sorry, cells within the body that have uh, abnormal state like virus or cancer-associated cells. So I will talk to you about the natural killer cells that I was working with them on my PhD uh, thesis. And uh, so the natural killer cells, they're about 5 to 15% of our uh, peripheral blood uh, lymphocytes. They belong to the innate immunity because they do not have the receptor recombination. So they have a certain amount of receptors that are known. And based on those receptors, they can recognize tumor or or viral infected cells and efficiently kill them. I will talk about uh, later also about the unique population of decidual NK cells that are surrounding the fetus during pregnancy development. And I would like to show you this movie where you will see a green fluorescent labeled the cancer cells being killed by natural killer cells. So you can see here that those cells are efficiently can recognize the cancer cells and eliminate those cells. They do the same also with virus-infected cells. So the question is how those cells are capable of recognizing those targets. So the idea is a balance between inhibition and activation. So we have receptors that inhibit the killing, or we have receptors that activate the killing of a target cell. And as you can see here, the inhibitory receptors, they recognize the major histocompatibility complexes, as we talked later, and this is the IDs of all the cells that have in them. We have some receptors that recognize stress signals or adaption through antibodies. But what was very interesting when I was starting my PhD, there's are three natural cytotoxic receptors on natural killer cells that when I was starting my PhD, there was no known cellular ligands to, to those receptors. So a lot of research in cancer is focusing on looking at a regular cell and a cancer cell trying to figure out what is the difference. The laboratory where I was doing my PhD was trying to figure out how the immune system evolved to recognize this difference. So the idea was to use the receptors that already exist to be able to do this differentiation and to understand how it's happening. So through different projects we have uh, discovered uh, a different glycosylation patterns on cancer cells that are associated with all three natural cytotoxic receptors. Uh, we have found uh, envelope uh, proteins of uh, dengue virus and West Nile viruses that are recognized by those receptors. We also showed that uh, different glycosylation patterns on the antibodies in ALS patients can induce killing of neuron cells in this neurodegenerative disease. And the most interesting uh, discovery, and that's what I want to talk to you about today, is the PCNA, proliferating cell nuclear antigen, but it, that is being recognized by one, of, by one of these activating receptors, the NKP44. So I want to mention that this molecule, the proliferating cell nuclear antigen, is highly associated with cancer cells and proliferation, and it's even used as a biomarker for cancer activity. So what we have discovered is that this receptor, the NKP44, has a binding to the PCNA. I would like just to say for one moment, when I'm making a statement like that, that there's a binding between the receptor and a molecule, it means that I did at least five different types of assay to show that, at least three replication of div each one of this assay, and did statistical analysis that in each one of those 15 experiments, 
I could be mistaken less than 5%. Okay, so when I'm making a statement, it's because I really checked it. <clears throat> so we found the binding between this uh, cancer-associated molecule and this activating receptor, but we wanted to see the function. And for that, we, we created different tools to be able to research that. And one of the things that we have done is creating these cell lines. And this is a HeLa cancer cell line that we created this pCNA that is fused with a green fluorescent protein. And we had a control, of course, of just green fluorescent protein. We checked that the molecule is behaving as expected. One second. Oh that the molecule is behaving as expected, that it's changing its position during cell cycling, and that with the GFP, there's no much difference, and it's through the whole uh, cell. Uh, GFP is the green fluorescent protein that is used in many uh, types of this uh, research. To our surprise, what we have discovered is that this cancer-associated molecule is inhibiting the activation of natural killer cells. So you can see here that the cells that express higher level of this molecule are actually protected from the killing of the natural killer cells. And we were very surprised by that. To validate this, we also created a tool that we can silence this, uh, this molecule, and this is called the silencing RNA. We're not gonna go into that, but I just wanna show how general it is. And you can see here that on top we have the cancer cells that we reduced the amount of the molecule, and we checked it uh, also in uh, cervical cancer, in pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, and glioblastoma, and in all of those cases, this cancer-associated molecule is giving protection to the cells from the immune system. And for me, it was a big surprise, because this receptor that is binding evolved very late in evolution in primates, and what I could not understand, we have very nice results showing what is happening, the binding, the protection of the cancer cells, but why a, a receptor like that will evolve when it's supposed to recognize cancer and kill the cancer, it's actually being inhibited by the cancer. So my eureka moment of my PhD actually happened not, uh, not while I was running an experiment on analyzing data, it's when I was sitting in the library going through the literature trying to figure out the question for that. Because what I love in biology, there's logic behind the mechanisms that we see. And I was reading the literature, I was before meeting with my uh, PhD committee and I wanted to explain to them why we see those results. And actually at that point, we just discovered that my wife was pregnant with our uh, first uh, child and she was six uh, weeks uh, into the pregnancy and I was leading the, the literature and what I found that the other tissue that express high levels of this molecule is all the tissue that surrounds the embryo during pregnancy development. And one of the basic things in immunology that we do not understand is how an embryo or a fetus survives the mother's immune system. Because I explained to you on the major histocompatibility complexes that half of them are paternal coming from the father. So how come the mother's immune system is not killing those cells? And what is very interesting that the natural killer cells are the main immune cells that are surrounding the embryo during pregnancy development. And the adaptive immunity is pushed away. Uh, so what I propose that this mechanism that we see is actually protecting the embryo from the mother's immune system and that the cancer cells are using these mechanisms also to evade the immune system. And, we, and when we think about it on the evolutionary scale, it's much more important to hold up pregnancy for nine months without killing the fetus than to be more prone to cancer. So I got very excited about this idea and this theory. I came to my PhD advisor and I asked him to start working on pregnancy immunology uh, instead of cancer for the last year and a half about, uh, of my uh, PhD. And luckily for me, he agreed. I was very excited about this idea. Little I knew that it will take me at least a year just to get the permissions in the hospitals to collect placentas after deliveries and things like that. And not only that, to start studying about pregnancy disorders and pregnancy immunology while, while your wife is pregnant and you are becoming paranoidic uh, immunologist, <laughs> it's a very, very problematic thing. <clears throat> I apologize to my wife for being paranoidic during that time. <laughs> but um, 
but the thing is that we started uh, looking into that and we have discovered that the pCNA is given protection uh, to embryonic cells from natural killer cells uh, not to be killed. Uh, when we collected placenta from uh, regular uh, deliveries, we have discovered that the immune system is changing its morphology to be able to be prone to this uh, inhibition by the natural killer cells. And what was very interesting that when we checked uh, cancer samples, and uh, you can see here that the natural killer cells surrounding the tumor have the same morphology as during pregnancy. So the idea that the cancer is trying to mimic the processes that are happening within pregnancy to, to be able uh, to inhibit the immune system are true. But not only that, it was very interesting in understanding if in pregnancy disorders there is a problem with these mechanisms. And the main uh, pregnancy disorders are recurrent pregnancy loss, preeclampsia, or preterm labor, are all assumed uh, due to the mother's immune system uh, uh, reacting to the fetus uh, cells and creating inflammation. And what we have discovered, and this is of course with colleagues and later, that all three pregnancy disorders are associated with dysregulation of these receptor, uh, receptors on the natural killer cells. I don't want to go deep into all the results, but I just want you to look at the numbers over here of how many samples we succeeded in collecting in more than three years. And, and uh, so the two things that I have discovered during this research, one is that our knowledge of the innate immunity recognition during pregnancy is very lacking. There's a lot of things that we actually do not understand in all of those very important mechanisms, especially that all of us are coming out of pregnancy result. And the second thing that I discovered is that it's very hard to work, of course, on samples that are coming from the hospital, and we get in very low amount, and even with all the permissions and things like that, I assume many people talked about collecting samples from the oceans and things like that. I was going around delivery rooms trying to sign up women to give their placentas at the end of the delivery, and this is much harder. <laughs> um, so at that point, I was looking for a postdoctoral research uh, uh, here at the US, and what I have discovered is this unique uh, model of Bacillus schlesseri that has this natural transplantation phenomena that it's innate immunity base. And you can see here that it can share its blood system between the different organisms. And the laboratory that is working on this organism is the laboratory of Irving Weissman. So Irving Weissman, and this I took from the Wikipedia, is considered to be the father of hematopoiesis. So he have discovered the hematopoietic stem cells in mice and humans, and and the whole transplantation, which is called the bone marrow transplantation and today's hematopoietic stem cell transplantation because we know how to isolate it from the blood. There's no need to drill in the bone marrow uh, each time uh, someone wants uh, to donate. Uh, but he has this model of the Botrylus schlesseri for the last 40 years. And also what I understood that also in transplantation, when we check for the different genes to find the perfect donor, all we check is for adaptive immunity. So even 100% uh, predictability is only based on the 10 alleles that we check of the adaptive immunity. So that still will give us about 80% of success. And the idea is that 20% that we do not understand is due to the innate immunity recognition. And this is the main immune part that is taken also in the pregnancy. So the idea was to use this model to understand what are the basic mechanisms of the innate immunity to recognize the different uh, uh, the different tissues. And so why the Botrylus schlesseri is a good model to study the innate immunity recognition? Because if we look on the evolutionary scale, it's one step before the adaptive immunity. So it's our closest invertebrate relative, it's part of the chordates, and it's one step before the adaptive immunity. So all of its recognition of tissues will be innate immunity based, and we will understand what are those evolutionary processes that have to happen in those very important uh, tissues. So the, as you can see, as a larvae is a tadpole, as the rest of the chordates, and then the animal is settled down, making the zoid, and the zoid can reproduce asexually to create a colony, and the colony is collected through the blood vessels of the animal. So the, the cycle of this uh, reproduction, we have 
a, a zoid with the young buds that are being developed through a cycle, and then we have uh, programmed cell removal when the old uh, bud is being taken over by the young generation, and the young generation is taken over in this process. And I will make I will show you a movie of that. Is it? No, it's not right. Oh. So you can see here, this is the older generation, and this is the young generation that is growing. There's a programmed cell removal. It's taken over, and the same will happen with this zoid and its young generation, and you can see that it's taken over. This is a movie that was done uh, over uh, three days. So this is a weekly cycle that is uh, happening. But the most interesting phenomena in the Batrillus is the natural transplantation phenomena. And I will explain. When two different indiv individuals of different genotypes are coming together with the ampullis, which are the end point of their blood vessels, they can either reject, and this rejection is happening uh, to all of us if we get uh, tissues that are not ours, or they can fuse. And this is the unique mechanism, and the fusion is through the blood system. So the fusion is happening through the ampullis, as I said, the end point of their blood vessels. And after they succeed in uh, fusing, the blood system can freely go from one animal into the other. And this is including the immune system, and it's including also the stem cells. So we have also this natural transplantation phenomena, which is either rejection or fusion. And after they fuse, we have this free movement of the blood, including the stem cells. And the stem cells are now competing in this new chimeric animal who will build the new tissues of this, uh, of this animal. So we also have the natural transplantation phenomena, and it's also stem cell based and stem cell competition. So while a lot of research was done on a whole animal level to understand this mechanism of the fusion and the rejection and how it happens, there's also a lot of uh, molecular and genetic work was done to understand which genes are appearing. So I came to the laboratory to try to figure out what are the cellular mechanism in this animal that will enable this fusion or rejection. What is the recognition that is happening with the immune system and how does it happen? And I want to understand those different receptors or targets or how, uh, how the cells are knowing if it's self or not self or they should fuse. So the first thing that I have done is to create functional assays of the, on, of the immune system. So the two main cellular uh, effector mechanisms of the immune system are either phagocytosis, which is an engulfment of a target, or cytotoxicity, a direct killing of a target like was done with natural killer cells and T cells that I explained in human. And what we have discovered that the rejection is based on the cytotoxic cells, just as happens to us with the T cells and the natural killer cells, and the phagocytosis doesn't change between comparable and rejecting colonies. So this is done uh, on isolated cells. What about in the animal itself? For that, we have developed a differential labeling markers of the colonies before they come together. So either labeling them in green fluorescence or red fluorescence before they come in, and this is live animals. And we can see here a fusion of a blood vessels or points of rejection. And what is interesting that within those points of rejection in these areas where we have a lot of dying cells, we see a mixture between the green and the red cells in this area, which suggesting that cytotoxicity can take place when the tissues are uh, meeting with each other. So the transplantation is immune recognition based uh, phenomena. I do want to emphasize that this is done on live animals using the transparent body of the Botrylus, and we can see those cells Oh, can you see those cells? Yes. So we can actually see those cells in a real transplantation going from the green animal into the red or from the red animal into the green. So we can follow this natural transplantation phenomena in live animals uh, through the tissues. So now we can also see where those cells are going, where they're settling down, and how this stem cell-based transplantation happening, and they're going to this new buds and trying to develop it. And now we can try to analyze it, and we can see on a 3D reconstruction level exactly how this transplantation is happening. If the movie will respond. Uh, how is it happening? And we can see here developing bud and secondary buds. Uh, of this uh, colony, 
And not only that, now we can actually measure the chimerism, the level of the cells that succeeded being transplanted. And this is, and this is five weeks after transplantation, we can still know the numbers of the cells that were successfully or not transplanted. When I was showing this results to someone that went through hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and he said this is amazing that you can use the transparent body instead of drilling into the bone marrow of a patient and trying to figure out how successful was the transplantation, he said he was very envious of this animal that it can be done on this uh, easier level. So um, the question is now which cellular populations are doing this recognition and how does it happen or more what is the immune system? And in order to ask the question, how the cells recognize, we need to understand which cells are actually doing the functions that we see. So I will make a very long story very short. Uh, I have isolated the cells from the animals. I analyzed them by uh, flow cytometry, is a tool that is used in immunology for the last uh, 30 years. And I adopted different tools to be able to use it on marine animals. And on this level, I think it's the first time we have done on any invertebrate species. You don't need to remember anything, just we succeeded in isolating 34 populations of this animal during that research. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is how the cells look before uh, going through our gating strategy. And this is some of the populations that we are analyzing. And this is much more a uh, homogeneous population that we can start working with. We succeeded in finding out uh, three different phagocytic populations within this uh, organism uh, through that research. And what is very important, we also succeed in finding the cytotoxic cells that are doing the process of rejection within these animals. And we can understand exactly how it's happening. And we can ma manipulate now this cytotoxicity activity with the different uh, genetic tools that we have. And I want to give you an example of one of these processes that we learned on, and we had a theory that it's based on cytotoxicity. And here I need to explain a bit about uh, acute rejection and chronic rejection. So when a transplantation is not uh, compatible, uh, then we have acute rejection, immediately a strong inflammation. Uh, we attack the, the transplanted organ, and we kill it. But there's also a, a chronic rejection. And this is when we have a transplantation. And with the time, we build the immune response that is happening against uh, this organ. And we have the same that is happening with the botrylis. The acute rejection is that I showed you that from the beginning they do not fuse. But a chronic one, it's after two animals come together, then one of the animals actually during the cycles of this programmed cell removal is not just removing the, the older generation, but also preventing the young generation, creating inflammation in the area that is killing also the next generation. And this is a much more like a chronic rejection because this is happening weeks or even months after the colony is already fused. So we had a theory that this activation is happening through the cytotoxic cells. Because of the phagocytic cells are anyhow doing the programmed cell removal, then the cytotoxic ones that can induce the rejection that we found can uh, take part of this. And what we have done, we have transplanted this activated cytotoxic cells compared to a control cells. And just by inducing these cytotoxic cells, we succeeded in inducing this uh, chronic rejection-like phenomena and killing the next generation after, uh, after we have this takeover of the colony. And you can see here that all of that area where we had this transplanted cytotoxic cells killed the next generation and prevented from those zoids to develop. So we had a proof that the cells that we recognize and we know, we understand how they work on the cellular level. We also wanted to understand on the molecular level. And this is what are the different molecules that are used in these different processes. And we compare the process of the regular programmed cell removal compared to this cytotoxicity activity that is killing the cells. And the idea is here we have a non-inflammatory process where the phagocytic cells just uh, take in uh, the dying cells, or we have a cytotoxic activity that is actually inflammating and killing it. And the two molecules that we wanted to look on, I'm not going to go into that, one is a direct activator of the immune system, and one is marking cells for being uh, uh, removed without inflammation. And we succeeded in inducing twice as much uh, killing of the cells, one by directly activation and one by blocking this mechanism. And because it's two different mechanisms, we wanted to see whether they will work synergistically together. 
And as you can see here, when we fuse the two molecules together, we have seven folds increase in this rejection. So we understand also on the cellular level and also on the molecular level how those mechanisms are working within the model. And I want to explain to you how translational medicine is working. And the idea is to take those basic ideas back into cancer or into transplantation. So where else do we have a process where we have all the time dying cells being removed but without inflammation? And this is in tumors. In tumors, we have cells that are dying all the time, and they're being removed, but there's no activation of the immune system to remove the main tumor that is the source of those cells. And what we have done, using, again, natural killer cells, we use the same homolog molecule in humans that we used in the Botrylis, and by using this molecule, we succeeded in killing the cancer cells twice as much than uh, without using this molecule that is blocking this non-inflammatory removal of the cells. So the basic mechanisms that we find in this organism can be translated into what we find in humans. Okay. Um, so I just want, uh, for the end, to give uh, some explanation about the finding of the hematopoietic stem cells within this organism. And uh, I'll give you an example of uh, one of the uh, experiments that we have done to show it. Uh, so we have found the hematopoietic stem cells uh, candidate within this model uh, on different observational levels. And we wanted to test whether they can create different cell types uh, of the blood of this organism. And one of the interesting phenomena that we have is pigment cells within the blood that are either blue or orange in our colonies. So what we have done, we have taken a large orange colony, isolated its stem cells or control cell populations, injected them into colonies we either have in a mixed uh, between blue and orange pigmentation, pure blue pigmentation, or a pure orange pigmentation. And three weeks after transplantation, we have analyzed uh, those colonies. And while the control population had exactly the same ratio of the uh, pure blue, pure orange, or a mixed population of the pigment cells, what we have discovered that there was a significant reduction of a pure blue colonies, and we had a significant upregulation of the mixture between the blue and the orange. And this shows that this hematopoietic stem cell succeeded in differentiating and creating other cell types, including the pigment cells that gave rise to this orange pigment out from the uh, original uh, orange colony. And here I want to show you something. So we also found the organ where this hematopoietic stem cells are going within the botrylis. It's called the endostyle. It's an organ in the center of the animal. But what is very interesting when we looked at this organ and compared this gene expression to our own uh, human, uh, uh, human uh, genes, we have found that it has a significantly similarity to our own hematopoietic bone marrow. So it means that it's not just has the hematopoietic stem cells that can create the other immune cell types, but it, it also has the organ that it's exactly as our own bone marrow, at least the hematopoietic niche within the bone marrow. And this is actually very interesting because the main organ of hematopoiesis in the different animals can be very different organ. It can be either a bone marrow, a head kidney, a provertebral arc, but the niche itself where the stem cells can, can grow and can create the different cell types can be very different. And the question is, what are the basic mechanisms that need to be in the different animals to be able to create that? So I would like uh, to come to conclusions about uh, the research. So I showed you at the beginning uh, a mechanism uh, by which cancer cells are, uh, are inhibiting the immune system. And we showed that this mechanism evolved actually to protect the embryo during pregnancy uh, development. And uh, then how we use a new model uh, to study this innate immunity recognition. And we have discovered different immune cell types, the stem cells, and also the organ of uh, hemat hematopoiesis. And we showed that it's homologue to our own hematopoietic uh, bone marrow. So I want to say that we succeeded in this organism to have the full cycle of a stem cell transplantation from being able to isolate the stem cells, their interaction on the cellular and the molecular level with the immune system, localization to the stem cell niche in the stem cell organ, and showing that this actually is very relevant and homologue to what is happening in our own uh, tissues and uh, in our own bone marrow. 
So, of course, I was not alone to do this research. There's a lot of people that I need to thank and uh, uh, funding sources, of course. First, I want to mention the Ben Gurion University and all the part of my PhD work uh, was at Angel Porgador's uh, laboratory and there was uh, a lot of good students that I was working with. Um, of course, my laboratory, Irving Weissman, my advisor, Ayelet Waskoboynix, who's running the marine part and the Botrylus uh, project uh, in the laboratory, our collaborators, of course, my funding sources, uh, coming uh, from the NIH, uh, also the hematology training grant and the immunology training grant, uh, also the International Organization of the Human Frontiers uh, Scientific Program, and uh, also the Roch Rothschild Foundation that uh, paid me at the beginning uh, to come here for uh, postdoctoral research. And at this point, I would like to thank you for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer at any part of the research or any part of uh, immunology that I can answer. Um, yes, I saw a hand here. Um, Dr. Rosenthal, yes. how far away, how, how much in time are you away from this having a practical application? Um, so, uh, that's a very good question, and I do want to emphasize that what I'm doing is a very uh, basic research to understand the mechanism, and, uh, and the question is what exactly you discover and what you succeed, and that's the question for translational uh, medicine and how fast you can move it. So, for instance, the PCNA story that I told at the beginning with the cancer, uh, my current laboratory where I did my PhD are developing uh, small parts of this molecule that can be added, and instead of uh, the PCNA inhibiting the immune system, is actually succeeding in preventing that process from happening. And this has now been uh, trialed first, of course, in mice and things like that, but the idea is that eventually, if it works, it can move uh, towards medicine. The part that I showed that we succeeded in activating the immune system with natural killer cells against cancer from the Botrylus, so Dan Corey, uh, Dr. Dan Corey, is now continuing to take this research, trying to prove in mice that it's happening, and they're about to publish this paper also, and hopefully, eventually, that uh, also this will lead to treatments. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm more on the basic side, and we're trying to figure out how it's working in order to start changing the things that we know. So, um, um, so... It's a while. Usually a project, even if it's going well and you discover, we're talking about a decade or 15 years uh, until it's getting to the clinic. So we're, I'm on the basic side of that uh, science, trying to understand mechanisms that we still don't know. Oh, you're welcome. Yes. Um, um, yes, yes, uh, they do work together. But for instance, the B cells and the T cells are part of the adaptive immune system and they're creating the immunological memory. The B cells are creating the antibodies and the antibodies are going through our tissues, of course, uh, through the blood and they can recognize everything, uh, bacteria, viruses, uh, cells, uh, different molecules and uh, and the antibodies are bringing other cells that can be activated upon it, like the phagocytic cells. If you have a, if you have a cell that is covered with antibodies, then phagocytes will, will eat it, or natural killer cells will kill it uh, based on these antibodies. While the T cells, their main job is actually to check our own cells. So to be honest with you, there's no democracy in the body. If something is is wrong with you or something is different than what we want you to be, then you will be killed. And this is the job of natural killer cells and T cells. So the T cells are checking on this molecule which is called the major histocompatibility complex, uh, all the fragments of the different molecules that we have within the cell. So each cell have to have this ID with them and, and presenting the different molecules we have within. If the T cell is recognizing that this molecule should not exist in a normal cell, it can be a viral protein, it can be a transformative uh, cancer cell that have some different or mutation in one of these protein, uh, proteins, then it will be killed. So the T cells is actually mainly against our own cells. That's why they take more part in the, 
um, in the transplantation, because this is our, like our cells that are a bit different uh, than the B cells. And this is why I was focusing more on the cellular immunology, and this is actually recognizing the cells and to understand when something is different with them. I hope I answered your question. Okay. So the B cells are creating the antibodies. They're more towards a humoral immunology. They create the molecules that can recognize different, different things that are pathogens uh, coming from outside. Yeah. Um, yes? <laughs> I, I, I will do a solicitating and I will say that I'm uh, establishing my own laboratory uh, for uh, comparative and evolutionary immunology um, next year and if you have uh, talented uh, students who would like to come I will be happy of course uh, to do so um, uh, but it's a very good question as you can see my research was taken in different directions from cancer into pregnancy to marine models uh, transplantation and I have to say that today I more feel like a comparative immunology and I do want to understand how different organisms evolve to protect themselves from the sea of pathogens that they're living in and obviously all of us are surrounding and we're thinking of corals or even bacillus who live dec decades and they still succeed in fighting all the viruses and the bacteria that are out there and I think it will be amazing, you know, to discover that corals have 10 molecules that can fight 90% of the viruses. And as I said, modern medicine doesn't have a lot of ways to do it. And if we can give you a cocktail of this uh, 10 proteins and you can fight most of the viruses, that will be amazing. Um, but again, this is a basic research. I don't know what I will find. <laughs> Thank you.